Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners, so please note that listener discretion is advised. Today's guest is a very special guest. I have Julie Floxton. She's a licensed clinical social worker, and she is also the owner of Julie Floxton Counseling, also known as Therapy Rocks. She was recently the recipient of the 2018 National Social Workers Early Career Award. She received her master's degree in social work in 2015 from the Metropolitan State University of Denver and is currently pursuing her doctorate of social work at Capella University. And she's been working in mental health for 23 years. She specializes in working with women who have been victimized and have been the recipients of emotional and psychological abuse. And so she's been doing a lot of great things. And I'm happy to have her on the show today because she's going to be up here talking about psychological abuse uh, with us today, which is how we connected. And so I'm excited to share this episode with you because I think she drops a lot of wonderful gems on this episode. Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm good. How are you today, Dr. Matt? I'm doing well. I'm so happy to have you on the show, right? It's been a long time in the making, but, you know, I feel like we're sisters. We're down the hall from each other, and you and I, we, like, engage all the time on social media, but, like, and I'm like, why didn't this meeting happen before? But it's happening now, and I think it's a great time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I um, was just very honored that you even thought of me and asked me to come on your show today. So thank you for having me. You are quite welcome. And I think, you know, one of the reasons, I was like, why didn't I invite her? Is because we have a lot of very similar, we have very similar niches and, um, you know, things that we work with women on. And so with that being said, can you tell, can you introduce people and tell them who you are and kind of what you work with? or who you work with, right? Not what, but who you work with. Absolutely. So my name is Julie Cloxton, and I have a private practice. It's Julie Cloxton Counseling, and we also do business at Therapy Rock. Mm-hmm. And prior to opening my practice a year ago, I worked as a disability specialist in my own private business, um, and I still do that where I work with specifically individuals who are diagnosed with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And so um, I've been doing that for years. And then I went back to school several years, maybe like 10 years ago, um, and started the process to become uh, licensed and also educated and all the things that you really need to do the work that I do. And so a year ago, I opened my practice and I focus primarily on three populations, and that would be psychological abuse, victims, and survivors. Mm-hmm. And typically, those are people who have survived relationships um, either from their family of origin or from a family or a relationship that they have uh, created after they have gotten to be adults. And it usually comes about when they enter a relationship with someone who um, either is diagnosed or not diagnosed with some sort of personality disorder, but uh, not always. And so I work with that population. I also work with individuals who are either diagnosed or have symptoms of eating disorders. Mm. And that came about when I worked for a little under Um, a year in a psychiatric hospital that specializes with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. 
And they just captured my heart. I just, I just love that population, and my patients were amazing. And so um, I carried that into my own practice. And then I also work with grief and loss. And I trained at a local not-for-profit that um, is here in my city where it's typically geared towards children and their families who have experienced death loss. And I ran three groups a week um, for different age groups, everywhere from very small children to adults. So um, I carried that also into my practice. So that's what I do. Yeah, that's amazing. And I also, I've worked with people with intellectual disabilities, in fact, still continue to do so in the correctional system. A lot of the guys yes. that are in corrections have intellectual disabilities. So that's very interesting. We have even more in common than I thought. Um, and you're here to specifically talk about psychological abuse um, in, in the women that you work with. Um, and I'm curious to know what got you into working with women who've experienced psychological abuse? This is an area that's extremely personal for me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of clinicians tend to draw from their own personal experience. And that's where we tend to um, feel very passionate. Mm -hmm. And that's truth here. So having experienced myself psychological abuse and also having been very interested in mental health as I was going through school and learning about uh, the different types of mental health issues that there are and also the different types of personality disorders and the different types of developmental disorders that there are. Um, it was just very uh, interesting, and I, I think it all played a part in how I ended up working with this population. But I would have to say almost 100% it, it started with my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. That would be, for me, I think what drives my passion the most in that area and knowing what individuals who have gone through psychological abuse experience. Um, every situation is always a little bit different, but there are so many similarities sure. that um, it just almost makes for a community. And actually, we call it a psychological abuse community. Mm. So that's very interesting. And what was it about your own experience that said, you know, I want to work with people? who have a similar experience than me? Because, you know, a lot of times that can be very difficult. You know, it can be very tricky mm -hmm. to listen to people with stories that are similar to your own. But what was it specifically that you feel like said, make me, I want to work with people like this? Well, to be honest, Dr. Nat, I just pretty much live my life one big trigger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do grief and loss. I lost my mom two years ago on Mother's Day. Um, you know, working with eating disorder patients is not as triggering, but knowing that it's rooted in so much trauma, um, a lot of things come up that the eating disorder itself is really the symptom a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So that um, can be hard, more um, just the compassion that you have. Mm -hmm. But psychological abuse, having experienced it, um, it can be very triggering at times, so I have to do a lot of um, taking care of my own mental health and my own um, well-being and making sure that I am practicing self-care. Sure. Um, all along in school, we were taught self-care so much so that it would just make us tired. Sometimes we'd say, we're doing another self-care assignment, but really, they were life-saving us, um, in a sense, by you know, teaching us those skills because triggers do come up, but I'm more than the triggers, I'm more passionate about helping people because I know um, basically to experience psychological abuse, it does something to your soul. And I'm very mind, body, and spirit connected type of a, a clinician. Mm -hmm. And so it has really helped me to uh, understand how all those things are connected mm -hmm. and how important it is in spite of my own triggers, in spite of my own pain, to make sure that I'm putting out awareness 
about this, but also that I'm doing my part as a trained clinician yeah. to help people to heal. That sounds good. I love that. And, you know, and I know you touched on it before, but for those people who are not familiar, break down again for us what psychological abuse is, if you can. Yes, absolutely. So psychological abuse um, is typically um, brought on after someone has been in a connect connected relationship with somebody for maybe a small amount of time, maybe a longer amount of time. And what they start to do is to manipulate primarily uh, the individual who is the target of abuse. Psychological abuse encompasses all types of abuse. So some people think that it's just being name called and that's absolutely not the only thing that psychological abuse entails. Mm -hmm. Although it, it can include that, but for some survivors, there is no name calling. Um, it's done in other ways. It can be financially um, devastating, but really what it does is it's a systematic um, or cycle that I, or I should say a cycle of abuse where usually the individual is um, kind of sucked in by, like they feel like they have just found the ultimate partner. This person dotes over them and bathes them in attention and love and gifts and um, just really treats them with kindness and something that all humans are seeking to be wanted. And so that goes on for a little while, and then the individual starts to change their behavior, and you, that then causes the person who is on the receiving end of the behavior to try harder, because you think, oh, well, what, I'm not doing something right, or what did I do wrong? And really, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. The person who is the psychological abuser comes into the relationship with whatever issues that they have. Um, it's very important for me to explain that to people that individuals who are being abused did not create the problem. The problem came into the relationship. And um, so after they have been what we call love bombs with all the gifts and all the doting and all of those things, then typically what happens is we say the mask is starting to slip. And the person will start to do things that devalue the individual, and they will um, really make that person's self-worth mm -hmm. feel very low by the actions. Um, they will say hurtful things, um, but they'll say it under the guise or the premise of it being a joke, or it, you know, I really didn't mean that, or you're too sensitive, and they continue to perpetuate that it's your fault, that, um, you know, it's you who is the one that is too sensitive or you're taking it the wrong way. What is typically happening is this individual is typically disconnecting because they weren't really most likely connected um, to the individual anyway, and they um, tend to then start to discard. And so they'll discard um, in several ways. Sometimes it's physical abandonment. Sometimes it's a a series of neglectful behaviors. Um, silent treatment is huge. Um, and most people who experience psychological abuse will experience some sort of uh, abandonment or neglect. Mm -hmm. Even if the person is still living in the same uh, residence, they still um, find ways to show the person, the intended victim, the intended mm -hmm. target, that they're they're worthless to them. So they may cut off all sorts of things from conversation to paying bills um, to affection mm -hmm. or even sex. They'll even cut off, um, you know, just touch. Um, and that then spills over into the other areas of like financial abuse or um, things like that. And so once they've done that, and then sometimes they'll, they'll do a full discard. And that is where they will either just like ghost a person and just disappear, or they will create a big 
something blow up, some of them, and this big thing, and leave. And a lot of times what happens is the victim ends up looking like the crazy person or like the, you know, what they, what they say, you're crazy, you're this, you're that, because they tend to have all this emotion and pour out all of this emotion, you know, please don't do this, please don't leave me. And this person is going to do that anyway and leaves them and that's the discard. And all of this is very general, what I'm saying. Um, but then usually with a psychological abuser, they're not finished with that target completely. No matter how much they say hateful or hurtful things, they tend to then turn around and do what we call hoovering. Um, and that's named after the vacuum, Hoover, to suck that person back in. So what happens is they're doing this kind of back and forth with a person's emotions and all these chemicals are going around in our body that most of the time we don't even think about unless we're trained in this or unless someone has explained it to us. And that's creating uh, trauma bonding or Stockholm syndrome is what a lot of people um, would know it as. Okay. And so a lot of times the victim is then um, so desperate feeling and in despair that they will take that person back into their life and the whole cycle starts all over again. Mm -hmm. And you can have many cycles like where it's, you know, not as a, a big blow up or you can have what I call a cycle in a cycle where you're just spinning, just reeling through these cycles repeatedly. And then you'll have a larger one where they will um, actually physically for a long amount of time discard. Um, so that typically is what happens in psychological abuse um, is we see this cycle and it, it doesn't always look exactly the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. It can look lots of different ways. Um, one of the things about people who psychologically abuse they can be anybody, male or female. Um, that does not matter. I know there's a lot of statistics out there that say there's more males than females, but that doesn't really matter to me. Mm -hmm. What matters to me is if a person is experiencing this type of um, behavior from someone that they love or someone that they care about, um, they need to get help and they need to disengage from that person because it's definitely abuse. Um, so I think really it's very hard to know when you're in those, um, th those cycles because they have at the beginning manipulated um, so many things that the person who's being abused sort of goes into um, a fog. They aren't really sure, am I being abused? I'm not being hit, maybe. Or I'm not being maybe um, sexually abused. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, well, they're not having yes. sex with me. Mm -hmm. But that in a, in, a, in a relationship that where sex is important to the um, individual, that can be abused. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different ways that they find to um, inflict pain uh, besides physical. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so you described like a plethora of information. I mean, narcissistic abuse, psychological abuse, Lenore Walker's cycle of violence theory, as well as some other mm -hmm. stuff that's kind of thrown in the mix and all very, very true, but still um, not highly regarded as being abuse. Um, right. When you're talking, when you, excuse me, when you're talking about um, the mandated reporting, reporting agencies and things <laughs> like that, it, what are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about why this is not being recognized as a formal or even more powerful form of abuse, abuse that could be, uh, that action should be taken upon? I think it stems from our history. Um, not too long ago, people didn't even get in trouble for abusing children or women or black people 
for that matter, or people of other ethnicities, um, other cultures, or um, people from the LBT GQ community. Uh, and now I think that people are starting to become more aware mm -hmm. of not just psychological abuse, but abusive actions against people, period. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it really stems from the history um, and we haven't caught up. We are far from it. Yeah. I think because it doesn't always include bruises and broken bones, um, tangible things that like, you know, they can see a picture maybe in court of a black eye um, or a busted lip. But really with psychological abuse, the damage is very much internal. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it sort of gets blown off a lot of times. People think, oh, that's just, you know, people have arguments or people have banter back and forth. And that's not bullying. That's not abuse. When really it is. When someone is directing some sort of behavior towards another person that is hurtful to them and they're doing it with the intention of hurting, that's abuse. And it's just that basic. Um, and I think psychological abusers are a lot of times very manipulative. It really has nothing to do with intelligence at all. I've seen people um, through my work who are on the other end as the abuser have various IQs. Um, they're in various positions in jobs, and pretty much they – can be anybody. And so I think a lot of times people look and they say, well, that person doesn't look like they're abusive. Mm. And so they go with what a person looks like, but an abuser can look like anyone. Anyone can cross that line, but it's just when you have someone who like psychologically abuses, they typically um, tend to do it on a repetitive basis. You know, and I have to agree with you there um, in terms of the culture. And I, you know, part of me now even wonders about the abuse that we're talking about in our culture now. Is it, is it because it's politically correct or is it because people are really starting to really um, understand the impact of abuse? And I, I think it's a combination of both. And I want to say I have to agree with you in terms of where our culture has been because the only reason that abuse was ever, ever acknowledged in the first place, and I, I, don't, I don't know whether to be ashamed of this or whether to really give props to this, was because of the humane society. We mm -hmm. are only acknowledging abuse because people were abusive to their animals. And even in today's culture, I feel like people put animal rights above human rights. And so that's the mm -hmm. only thing that even for today, the Humane Society was actually the first to advocate for uh, abuse rights of victims, of, of children, women, all of that kind of stuff. They are the only reason that this is even in existence um, as of right now today. Um, and so that, that kind of, that's mind boggling, but at the same time, I'm very appreciative to those people who were able to advocate for that. Cause you could essentially shoot your, your spouse. Men could essentially shoot their spouse dead in the street and people mm -hmm. like it's nothing. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, even with psychological abuse, there's still that element there that people can still get away with things like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. If for 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 people who've experienced psychological abuse, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about what sort of impact that has on them. What are some of the symptoms and implications of someone who's been psychologically abused over time? You've talked about it a little bit, but just so people can say, okay, well, that that sounds like that could be me, but I'm not really sure if. If, if I've had a problem or I think I've healed from it, there's really nothing, um, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've moved on from that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So one of the things that happens in psychological abuse is um, gaslighting, and it's actually termed after a movie, um, a fairly old movie. Yeah, one of my favorites. And, 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it causes people to really distrust their own perceptions and their own reality. Mm-hmm. So what happens is individuals then get in what's called a fog. Um, in the psychological abuse community, when someone says, oh, they're in the fog or they're, you know, they need to come out of the fog, it's basically talking about where that person um, is as far as their own perception and their own thinking and how it's been skewed by the abuse. Um, So some of the things people will notice that they're starting to do is something even like pacing, which is a physical symptom Mm -hmm. of what's going on internally. They'll have confusion a lot of times, you know, or feel like they're forgetful or, you know, I, I, more than usual, um, a lot of times these things will happen. Um, A lot of times people will just say, like, I feel like I lost myself. I don't even know who I am. And um, they'll have panic attacks and they'll think, because a lot of people aren't familiar with panic attacks, that they're having a heart attack or that they're, you know, have suddenly become asthmatic, or that something is going on because they'll have these physical responses, um, which is actually coming from the psychological abuse and the effect it's had on their mental well-being. Um, Also, the individual who is on the receiving end of the abuse, a lot of times will contain themselves, contain themselves, contain themselves, and then have some sort of angry outburst. And they, and that's when the abuser will a lot of times use that and say, oh, you're just crazy. I, look what you did. And so they, they make the uh, individual who's been abused feel even worse. Um, and so um, rapid heart rate, obsessive thoughts, uh, sometimes people will start to eat too much and gain weight. Other times people will not be able to eat and they'll lose weight. Um, Muscle aches, inflammation in the body is huge, Um, and suicide. People will a lot of times have suicidal ideation and um, really just feel worthless and like life is not worth living. And there is a different kind of despair that happens when someone has been psychologically abused. And I feel like it's, it's come from several areas. One of them is grief and loss. They're grieving deeply that relationship that they had at the beginning and what their hopes and dreams were for that and what they thought it was. And there's a huge loss and a huge void there. Um, And so they're feeling the grief and loss cycle. But then they're also dealing with all of the um, chemicals that are released into their body. So they're typically in constant fight or flight. And I I actually just did a training last night and I learned that after you go into fight or flight, um, the half life of it is 13 hours. Mm -hmm. So 13 hours after a traumatic event, you are just still carrying around all of those things circulating in your system Mm -hmm. at 50%. And so People who are dealing with psychological abuse tend to stay in that area. It's not like there's a traumatic event, they come out of it, and then with animals, a lot of times they can forget it. Um, They tend to be able to, like, run. How it was talked about in this training was in the wild, you have a tiger or something running for its life. And after that happens, they know how to calm their system down. Well, when a human being is under continuous abuse, it's very hard for us to do that or to even have those skills. Um, A lot of us don't. And so we stay in this perpetual heightened um, sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Depression can happen to people. And post-traumatic stress disorder, known as PTSD, or in the psychological abuse community, um, a lot of people will term it CPTSD. And really, it has the same symptoms, and I really like to educate people and let them know it's not just military individuals that have PTSD. It's anybody who has experienced a traumatic event or series of events in their life, Mm -hmm. and psychological abuse is um, a long, usually a long series of traumatic events 
um, on a regular um, basis. Also leaves you very unstable, so you never know when the next shoe, if you will, is going to drop. And that in and of itself keeps you in anxiety and can cause depression. Mm. I notice a lot of people when they first come out of um, psychological abuse will have a lack of energy and a lack of interest in the things they used to have. Um, a lot of them have been isolated from friends and family, and so they don't really have that support system uh, for a lot of people or the friends and family they did have have become weary a lot of time yeah. at watching, yeah. you know, them go through this cycle. And so a lot of times it leaves that person feeling even more alone. That is so interesting that you say that, um, or you maybe even feeling like you're in the twilight zone. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's so important, too, that you named a lot of the physical symptoms, right, that people have, because a lot of people, they think in terms of the physical still, and it's still, there's still a lot of stuff that goes physical, but it's very physical with it, and that you also named that being in a psychologically abusive relationship is traumatic. A relationship mm -hmm. can be very traumatic, and that has an impact to you know, and maybe you can speak a little bit about this because I've written about this and stuff like that, but with the relationship, just like a veteran, and I used it, it wasn't like a, a veteran, but just like a veteran or other people who've experienced trauma in a relationship, you can carry that with you, um, mm -hmm. that baggage with you mm -hmm. to the next relationship, that line of thinking um, and still be, um, you know, carrying out that same story or attracting people that are very abusive in your relationships mm -hmm. because that's how you're moving through your life in that traumatic, or as you said, simply said, Stockholm Syndrome-like mm -hmm. manner and be attracting those same people, or that same energy in your life. What do you think about that in terms of us attracting the same types of abusers? I think there is absolutely truth to that. I think sometimes what happens is we don't look at ourselves either and what we have going on, why we would not recognize or why we would, once we do recognize, mm -hmm. continue to be in um, situations like that. And I'm not victim blaming at all. I'd be the last person to do that because I've been a victim myself. Yeah. But um, what I'm saying is I feel like because a lot of times we don't know ourselves very well, um, we tend to keep falling into those relationships. Um, there's a quote that I found, and it says that the ongoing impact of narcissistic abuse on victims is similar to being a prisoner of war. And that's from Brown, 2016. And I think that a lot of times people go with what they know. So if that's the relationship they entered, yeah. it may stem from their family of origin. Maybe there was um, parts of their relationship with parents or siblings that were um, very psychologically abusive or physically abusive. And they think, well, this isn't abuse because I wasn't. Um, and, you know, when I grew up, I was beaten, and now, like, I'm not being touched, so this isn't so bad. Or they have nothing um, to really base it on. They did, haven't seen abuse before, maybe, and so they're not really sure. But I think absolutely, if we don't address psychological abuse in ourselves and what we've experienced, we have the propensity to end up in another relationship where we are yet another victim um, of abuse. And because even though a lot of it's the same, there's still a lot of things that people who abuse can do differently. They come from different angles. They're individual. And so, you know, sometimes when you come out of abuse, you don't even trust your own self. And getting into a relationship very shortly after 
getting out of one where you have been in psychological abuse can be very dangerous because you haven't taken the time first to heal and deal with your own stuff, but also to learn about what you have experienced mm -hmm. and how to prevent that. And even with that, um, people sometimes still end up in relationships yeah. with someone who isn't good for them. But what happens is if you have gone through appropriate therapy or appropriate um, groups where you're meeting with a clinician and they're meeting with other people, for example, then you have the tools to say, oh, this is a red flag. Oh, no, I'm not. And you also have the strength in yourself to say, I'm worth this. I'm worth walking away from this. I'm worth getting out of this. Yes. Um, and it takes a while after being abused to regain your self-worth. Um, a very long time. It's something that many people who have been psychologically abused struggle with years down the line. Yes. And I think that it's very important to address those things um, and also to make sure that you're studying, learning, educating yourself on it, but also that you're going and actually getting professional help yes. um, with people who are trained and can help walk you through. Yeah. Um, so that's my thing, but I definitely think there's a connection there. And I definitely think that the propensity of getting into another relationship is very high or the same relationship repeatedly. Correct. I think um, because typically, as I was saying earlier, a person who is a psychological abuser will circle back. And um, one of the things that I know um, that I've heard directly from a psychological abuser is that the players change, but the game remains the same. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it can be weeks, months, or even years, and they'll a lot of times return, almost as if they have a trophy wall and that they can put people on the wall and take them off at will. Um, I liken it to almost Toy Story the Disney movie where, um, you know, the, the little boy Andy throws, um, I think it's Woody in the toy basket and it's not really playing with them, but then, you know, it, it ends up coming sort of full circle mm -hmm. with that. That's the visual I get. And not to like cast a dark shadow on Toy Story because I love it, but um, I think that's very much how psychological abuse comes back around and people don't think that it will happen, but a lot of times it does. Yes, and I'd have to agree with you. And, you know, just for me um, and why I chose to make this podcast a little bit different, as well as my own Facebook group, one of the things that I've noticed um, just in other groups in, in being around people who identify as being a victim of psychological abuse is that they over identify with being a victim mm -hmm. um, and it's a constant woe is me like this person did this to me and they hurt me and you know and it's kind of like you know they over identify with being that victim so much so that they can't really see anything else or really um understand how their movement through life has really kind of continued the cycle of them being victimized. And so I really try to stay away from that, both in this podcast, both in my group, and just um, just in how I associate my practice is that, okay, you've been a victim, but if you don't change how you view yourself and how you view your experiences, you're really going to continue to bring on that type of energy. And I really want to stay away from that and focus on, okay, how, how are you looking at things now and how do you want things to look now? Mm -hmm. You know, in my practice and in, in the work that I do, I really view the victim and the narcissistic person or the victim and the abuser are doing this dance and they're kind of, almost in their same they're almost kind of the same in that they have this tunnel vision and how mm -hmm. 
through the world and how they view their experience. It's these things are being done to me. These are the way that I can move. And I'm not trying to say that they're one and the same. I'm just saying the way that they look at things can really get kind of very stuck and very rote. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They keep repeating these things over and over. Um, and I'm just curious to know, what are your views on that? I think I absolutely agree with you. Um, we tend to um, loop as humans a lot of times. Um, and so we get on, and, and that also keeps us in fight or flight. Uh, because, um, you know, to some degree, when a, it, it, it can be normal mm -hmm. at first, but what happens is a person goes and gets therapy after they're abused, they're shown other ways to help release. Not that they are um, forgetting their abuse. And one of the things that I think happens is people almost feel like if they don't stay in that loop, mm -hmm. and it may not even be conscious all the time, that they are um, abandoning what happened to them. Yes. That they are not honoring what happened to them when actually it's the opposite. Good. You have to really work to get yourself to a better place. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, this happened to me. And I totally understand it from the um, victim survivor side of it. Um, it can be many years and you can still then start back on that loop again. And you have to really say, okay, so. I need to get into therapy yes. and there are lots of types of things that a person can do um, when they're working with a therapist to do their own work mm -hmm. um, because you're right that tunnel vision is what really keeps people stuck not seeing outside of that yes yeah and so when you don't when you're not looking outside of that and looking within and trying to say okay so what what helped me to play into this? What helped me to stay in this loop? Like, what can I do to not be in this loop? When you do those things, it helps to move you forward. Yes. So Julie, what are some ways in which you would recommend that people start to work through their own stuff? How can they, how can they move past this being a victim or, you know, if they've, they've had this trauma. What are some suggestions that you have for people who've experienced this? So when a person first starts to realize they, you know, have definitely something's mm -hmm. wrong, usually they don't even really know what the words are or what any of this means. They're semi in a fog still, but they're, they're starting to know like, I, this doesn't feel good. I'm dying here. Like my soul is dying. I, this is awful. And they're starting to come out of it. The first thing I think that is good for them is to learn to, what psychological abuse is. It helps to validate mm -hmm. what you are experiencing and that it's real and that you didn't cause it, that you did not choose it necessarily. Like, oh, yes, you may have chosen that person, but you didn't choose to be abused. And knowing that you did not sign up with the intention of being abused and that this happened to you is very validating. Um, and so that's where, when people are first coming out, I like to always give them resources. A lot of people are comfortable with online um, resources. So going to um, different sites where they can read information yeah. or for example, like um, the site that you have um, a, with, you know, a group or just different areas um, on the internet or even podcasts like this one that you're doing that they can listen to, um, books that are out there. Um, I, I know I use a couple of resources on a regular basis. Can you share where, what the resources are that you use? Sure. I actually, I have, um, well, I have a lot of books, but um, one of the things I use um, for the um, I don't know if you can see that. Codependent. I, yeah. <laughs> yes. I love to have people read this book because even if they're not diagnosed with codependence, um, there are elements of codependence that they may have. Um, also, there are just personality traits that they may have that play into, um, 
what is happening to them. So I, I love this book for that. And I have this book. Oh, yeah, that's And it's classic. Walking the Tiger. <laughs> um, and this one I use because it is really good at um, the body-mind connection and knowing how somatic um, experience from what we have um, had happened to us plays into uh, just our being. So I use that one. Um, this book I use in my groups that mm -hmm. I do, Heal, yeah. Hidden from, uh, Healing from Hidden Abuse. Sure. And I um, absolutely love this resource. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very easy to read. It has some research at the beginning, so it gives you um, an element of actual back research, but yeah. then it's very easy to read and understand. And it goes through the different cycles and the different areas and also um, helps people learn how to go through, through those cycles and areas, but also to restore themselves. Um, and so I like that resource. And this one, um, uh, Lundy. I, I love using this, yes, mm -hmm. um, because this is validating in um, learning uh, as an abuse victim, you always want to know, like, well, why, why, what, how, like, what, how does this happen? Or am I the only one that's yes. happened to? Yes. And so, um, this is one of those resources that I feel does that. Um, there's another one I like called the Brain Fix, mm -hmm. and this isn't necessarily um, abuse related. But I'm very big on learning about the brain and, and the connection of the different parts of the brain and how it works in our body. And mm -hmm. so for people who are interested in that, I um, like to pull this one out. And there's just tons of resources. There's this other one, um, The Wizard of Oz of Narcissists. I love that one. And yeah, so I these are just a few of the resources. Um, and the body keeps the score that's oh, my yeah. other one <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah so um and i've done some training um uh through an organization that uses um those some of those materials and mm -hmm. i just think some of the therapy that individuals can get where they are learning how to heal are some of the most important ones um so i like i was trained in act which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And I was actually trained in that when I worked with patients who are diagnosed with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. But I found that it, it's very good for people who have experienced trauma and you know all sorts of like developmental trauma. Um, so I, I use that and it works, it pair, pairs very well, um, I feel, with individuals who've been traumatized. Um, through psychological abuse, and it's a little bit of cognitive behavior therapy and mindfulness, mm -hmm. and I'm a very eclectic therapist, so mm -hmm. um, once I became okay with that, I became very comfortable drawing from a wealth of um, information and a wealth of modalities. Um, I think, like last night, this training I went to talked about experiential therapy, and getting people out into nature and really helping them to uh, experience uh, in therapy. And then you don't always have to just do talk therapy, but there are other ways to help people to heal. So art therapy is good. Um, I think music therapy is great. I think there are just so many different things that trained clinicians can use to help people um, that definitely people can find healing. And it doesn't mean that they will never be triggered again or they will never um, think of that event again or those events or that life that they had as they were abused, but it means that they then come out of that fog and know that there's life beyond that and that they do um, have a place of enjoyment in their life and they um you know like i have my clients do smart goals i'm big on that like what are your goals for your life make them specific measurable 
get them written down because I'm very visual so you can see them, put a time on them. So you know, like, this is what I need to do and, and this is how I'm going to do it and this is when it's going to be done by. Um, and and I, I just think that also staying connected to your therapy throughout the week. So like not just going to therapy for 50 minutes um, and then compartmentalizing that and yes. going back to life. I think, you know, doing some assignments during the week that help you to think about and process are good and, and staying connected to people who understand what you've experienced is, is important. Yes. Um, and knowing that you do not have to or owe anyone um, your information. Yeah. So if someone is hurting you or on social media is huge, a lot of times people will say, well, I hate to block or delete this person or you need to do what's best for you to take care of yourself. So I'm huge on telling people you need to go no contact or have silent treatment mm -hmm. um, for your, for the, you know, it's not silent treatment, but you need to go no contact with people who are hurting you or inflicting abuse. Very true. Um, and how can people reach out and connect with you if they want to touch base with you, Julie? Yeah, so I the easiest way is I'm totally on Facebook <laughs> a lot. And so I have a business page on Facebook, um, and it's under Julie Clarkson Counseling. And I think I might have the actual, yeah, so it's www.facebook.com um, slash Julie Clarkson Counseling slash. Mm -hmm. um, that's the easiest way, or they can uh, email me at juliejmsw mm -hmm. at gmail.com, mm -hmm. um, or they can reach me at 505-JULIE12. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on and educating our audience. Julie, uh, you're a friend of the show. You're welcome back anytime. And I know people are going to love this. And you broke it down in such a way that was very beautiful, easy to understand. Um, you also have a Facebook group too, right? That people can join. Yes. Yes. So um, I'm an admin on a group that I actually found years ago um, when I was trying to heal myself mm -hmm. and it is, um, if you look up reflections of abusive relationships or roar, um, then you can join the group. It is a closed group, which means that only individuals in the group can communicate while in the group, mm -hmm. but it's not a secret group. So I always like to tell people that, um, but it's a closed group and it's a place where people can just vent, post how they're feeling, yeah. ask questions. And there are a lot of thousands, there's probably 17,000 people in this group, but the active members tend to really support, advise, and encourage one another um, in this group. And that was critical for me when I um, needed it most. And so that's something that I think is um, an important aspect of um, today with you know, social media and technology is having those types of uh, groups and avenues for healing. I agree. Um, and yeah, and I appreciate your group. Your group is a great space as well as you're one of the administrators in my group. So <laughs> yes. Yes. yeah, I'm a member of yours. You're an admin of mine. Are you working on anything, any projects or anything like that that people can support you with? Yeah, so right now I am um, getting ready to start a six-week uh, psychological abuse um, group support group, mm -hmm. and um, I want to keep it small between four and six individuals for every six-week session. I feel like that will help individuals feel more comfortable, and maybe there will be more cohesiveness, and just a safe space but also have the therapeutic component to it. So I'm, I'm working on that. I'm also working on a couple of speaking engagements that I've been invited to um, go and speak on mental health 
and domestic violence and psychological abuse to um I'm sorry. Who is this with? This is going to be at Colorado State University. Okay. Um, one of the multicultural sororities um, has invited me to come and speak to um, the young ladies in the sorority. So, and I don't know if they'll be opening it up to anyone else, but so I'm excited about that. Um, so if anybody has anything they think I should include in what I share or cover, yeah. um, I'm open to that. And um, I plan to write a book. Right now I'm in dissertation. Yes. You are for, for <laughs> I, yeah, right, right. I'm totally writing a book. Um, and I'm at data collection. And yeah. so um, that has been pulling a lot of my focus. But yeah. I, I plan to write um, my own personal story, which is pretty deep yeah. um, and pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty intense. And so I plan to use that, though, um, to share with other people that you can overcome the things that happen to you in life. That's amazing. And you can press forward and be the best you that you can be. And so that, you know, I'll, I will probably be reaching out and asking people, um, you know, if they want to, like, share a story or um, just, you know, I've been doing my research for that, too. So. That's amazing, yeah. That sounds like a great book. I can't wait to see all the great things you're doing, Julie. And I'm so happy that you came on the show. And I think it was a great um, conversation, much needed conversation that you and I had. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate that um, more than you know. And to all of the victims and survivors out there, I would just like to say that I genuinely have a heart for you and you can get past this and it is not your fault that you have experienced this type of abuse. That's correct. Yes, likewise here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so you just heard from Miss Julie Cloxton, and I think that she broke things down in such a beautiful way. I love the resources that she presented here. Um, it's, those are also wonderful books and things that I use with my clients as well. Anyhow, I would love to know what you think about this episode, so be sure to email me at a date with darkness at gmail.com. You can also feel free to leave those positive reviews, like, love, and share the podcast with friends, family, and foe. I'd appreciate that. And come on over and join the Facebook group. A uh, Date with Darkness group on Facebook as well. Um, I think the group is coming along beautifully. It's still very small and beautiful, but I think the group is very engaging and very interactive. So if you're not in that group, you are truly missing out. And until next time, be well and thanks for listening.